Hi, in this video, I will share with you what does data driven culture mean and how does one go about creating a culture in a team where data is the key to making all decisions. Data is everywhere, I feel. If you are making financial transactions, you are creating data with, which says that you are buying something, you are selling something. And together, if you look at all the transactions, you know overall the mood of the public as to who is selling what stocks. If you go to Google and search for certain things, if you go to Yahoo and search for certain things, that's data. You're generating data, and that tells a lot about what you're thinking, what you're feeling. Pretty much everything that you do on the internet creates data. If it's social network like LinkedIn or Facebook, they are creating massive amounts of data customer relationship management tools like Salesforce, even the gig economy with Uber and uh, Airbnb, they are creating data. They are trying to match demand with supply of uh, drivers with people who are trying to go from one place to other. Even messaging is creating a lot of data. When you watch movies on Netflix, you are creating a lot of data as to what movies you like, what movies you don't like. Pretty much all big companies today rely on data and that's why it's pretty important to form decisions based on data, the reality of what's actually going on. Many great products can be built if you use data accurately and data is exploding. Google Trends is an example of a product that's built purely based on Google search results and the sentiment of the public over the last few days, few weeks. And it tells you a lot about what everyone's thinking about. LinkedIn is also launching a new product, uh, Talent Insights. As you see in this video in YouTube, they can tell you as to what, what skills are in demand, what countries are hiring for what skills, how people are moving, what is unemployment in certain countries. So this data is very powerful. As you can imagine, you can predict what's what is on top of everyone's mind you can understand whatever what was in the history and you can also create regulations and laws that can govern better countries overall so data is very powerful data is huge data is everywhere and lots of data is being created and that's why it's pretty important that all decisions that we make in our teams of engineering teams is based on data and based on reality so what are some of the skills that are needed of an uh, engineer who wants to be part of a culture of data-oriented decisions? The first thing you need is be able to understand the business and product use case. So you really need to understand like what data is important. Why is certain data important? Once you understand the business better, you need to be able to translate those business use case into measurable metrics, things that you can measure. There will be use cases that, the, that are important to the business. In case of Google, it will be ad clicks. Then you need to be able to add revenue could be one of the big use cases for Google. And then they measure things like ad clicks, inventory, and delivery, impressions, and a whole host of things. So first, you need to be able to understand the business use cases of the company you're in, the situation that you're trying to solve for. Then you need to be able to convert those use cases into measurable metrics. And then you need to be able to communicate those metrics across various departments. So you need engineers to implement certain things. You need product to buy into some of those metrics as to why those metrics are signpost metrics for certain goals that you're trying to achieve as a business. You need to work with operations to make sure that those metrics actually flow through. And finally, you need technical aptitude to be able to translate and do those measurements um, design tests that are clean, you need to be able to build models, and you need real hard work and passion to improve over time. So if you, this is the first basic requirement, skills, four basic skills that are needed of every engineer in the team so that you could foster data-driven culture. So now let's take a look at what, what are some of the things you can do with data. The first thing you can do is you can find out what happened. For example, if LinkedIn wants to find out today what countries employs most number of people with software engineering skills like Java, then they can they can find that out based on the profiles of people. So data can help you understand what happened. 
Also, it can tell you what happened in the past. So if you have data over time, you can find out which ads on Google are running well, which ads are not running well. So you can, data can tell you a lot about what has happened in the past. So what happened in the past could be a very good proxy to learn so that you don't make mistakes in the future. Data can also tell you why it happened. So there might be certain reasons that certain things happen. So instead of relying on your gut feel, if you can use data to, to prove what caused what, then that's very powerful. So now you can understand at massive scale what causes what, not your gut feel. If you understand the past and if you understand what causes what things, you can also potentially predict what will happen in the future because you know certain trends, you know certain behaviors of human beings or even certain um, IoT devices which can predict nature in terms of uh, storms, all of that can be predicted now with much more accuracy based on historical data and future predictions. So you not only know about what happened in the past, you can with data tell why it happened, and you can also tell what will potentially happen with a high accuracy. And the final or the most important thing is you can also with data find and answer what is the best that could happen. So you can actually form your future by using the data and influencing certain things so that the best that could happen could be influenced by your decisions today. So you can shape the future in some form. So using data is very important. You can, you can look in the past, you can look at what happened, why it happened, what will happen in the future, and how you can best shape the future. But two things to consider is volume and processing complexity of data. Data is increasing in size, so storage is, although getting cheaper over time, it's very important to keep track of how much data you're generating and how difficult it is to process this data. So for us to now build data-driven decisions, we need to build the foundations of creating metrics, creating data. So let's take a look at what are the steps. The first steps is to understand the business use case. What are you trying to, what questions are you trying to answer or what questions are you trying to answer or solve? So if you don't clearly understand what are your business use cases, you cannot really solve for it or measure it. So once you understand your use cases, then you need to create a tracking spec that says in this product, I'm going to start measuring um, certain events of the user. And that now starts tracking the user's activity, user's behavior over time, and hopefully it'll help you answer your business questions. So first step, understand business use cases that you want to measure. Second, creating a spec that the engineers would use to implement. Third is get the engineers to implement that spec and then make sure that the implementation is as per the spec. The fourth step is to validate that everything that is implemented is actually, actually correct and there are no gaps. The fifth step is to clean the data. The engineers would capture a lot of data. They may capture data in not systematic form. So you need to clean it, you need to create tables that you could easily add metadata and you can really answer all of your business cases. So you need to extract, transform, and load your data into clean tables that are easily queryable. After that, you need to check that the ETL didn't introduce any more bugs, that it's actually working fine. So validate that the ETL actually didn't introduce bugs. After that, you need to build metrics. So you need to start running queries on a regular basis, build dashboards, build KPIs that are important and build reporting and alerts so that when certain metrics go down, that you are alerted. Finally, you need to build monitoring so that if issues happen, that it's automatic. The final, the final, final step is that you build insights. Once you build awareness as to what's happening, you could start using this data to inform your business strategy and based on the insights that you get. This is where the culture of data-driven decisions actually comes through in the final step. It requires you to set up the whole thing. You need to validate it. You need to monitor it over time and then learn from the data historically and based on the data, make decisions. Remember, you cannot really improve what you can't measure. So you really need to measure and these are the nine steps to measuring things accurately. There are five types of analysis. Uh, foundational analytics is where you clean the data, you do ETL process, you set up business goals, you make sure you work with developers and 
ensure tracking is working fine. The second is descriptive analysis is where you define what is happening. This is the analytics where you go into the description of what is happening. It could be KPIs. The third is inferential analysis. It's basically trying to answer what can we do better. And you could do things like A-B testing and find out which of the two tests, is it the control or the treatment that's working better. So inferential analysis actually uses data to actually make better decisions in the future. Predictive analysis helps you to answer, are we even solving for the right questions? Are we targeting the right people? So it's basically building machine learning models, propensity models that tell you what should we be actually doing. And then prescriptive analysis is where you go on improving your model by adding new features, you automate and improve with new data, new features, new label generation to make your model and prediction even more better over time. Because if the current model works for the current set of data, with new data, it needs to evolve. If it doesn't evolve, it gets obsolete over time. So there are different types of analysis. Something that's trying to set everything up uh, and make sure that it's working fine, something that's trying to answer what happened, what can we do better, are we doing the right thing, and how can we keep improving over time. So different types of analytics. A-B testing is a huge, huge area which you would need to get really good at if you want to use data-based decisions. So test everything that you do. Every little change could potentially be a huge change to your business metrics. And so it's very important to test every change that goes into production with uh, some sort of a test framework where you can find out for a given new change is better than the current old code base. Every code refactor is also important to make sure it's tested because code refactoring could introduce bugs that can overfire tracking. When metrics are too good, and if you don't expect them to be too good, then pause and ask the question, why is it so good? If you don't answer the question, then do not move forward. How you ramp quickly, balancing speed, accuracy, and risk is a super important research paper which LinkedIn um, produced in KDD conference, which I have a screenshot here uh, in 2018, which is a very important framework, like how fast can you move using the data what kind of risk are you willing to take and what is the quality downside to the users? So reading this paper will give you a pretty good insight on what sort of uh, framework to use. But overall, the paper is, the, key, the two key, uh, key insights for me was ramp all the way to 50% in, um, in a day-to-day -day break. Make sure that you stay at 50% for full power. Make sure you can test treatment and control at 50% with high confidence with certain p-value that you define and you need to deep, deeply understand what p-value is. You need to understand what power and ramp efficiency is. You need to understand um, if it's the right thing over time, if there's burn-in, and whole host of things, which I think this paper goes into a lot of details. So highly, highly encourage if you're really interested in doing A-B tests well, which is the foundation of all analysis, is uh, you understand this paper well. Finally, if you... If you want to have a culture in your team of data-driven decisions, you need to be able to not only measure, you need to be able to do the analysis, you need to have the data, but you also need to present your data in, in ways that that people can understand. So the, there are four steps that you can do to make sure that you present in a very effective way so that your team members and everyone in your higher leadership team understands the importance of data and they use data. So how do you go about presenting data? The four steps. First step is frame the business challenge. Define a key challenge that, that you're trying to solve. And then understand why is this challenge important to the business? So in the first slide, make sure you answer these two questions as to what is the challenge that you're trying to solve and why is this important? The second step is for you to define who is the person that can make this decision to who, who do I need to convince? What is their name? What is their role? And what is, what, is, what, is, what is it that they respond well to? And what is it they respond less to? So find out your target audience. Who is it that you're trying to pitch this presentation for? And then find out who is going to be deeply impacted by this change that you're recommending. And, and then also find out what are the key changes you are expecting them to do. So this is your second slide. First slide is to what are you trying to solve? Second slide is who are you trying to solve? Who you want to convince? What are the questions they'll have in their mind? Who do they think will be impacted? And what is your key ask? Third, prove with data 
using various data sets what kinds of data you have used to prove that what you're saying is true. So validate with data certain things that you're trying to prove. Finally, sharpen your story. Write the ending at, in, in the very beginning. Find a good opening. Choose the data that you're going to use and connect the dots. So for example, you could say, hey, I want to prove that delivery time of a given email or a, or a notification to a member is very important because if they are sleeping and if we deliver them a notification, it's less effective. So that's a business challenge that you're trying to solve. Now you could say, hey, I'm going to take a look at uh, certain data and I probably need to convince my product manager, my vice president of engineering that, hey, this is important. And so then find out like which teams are going to be impacted. What What is the impact on the user going to be? And so with data, now start to see if other companies have actually done certain experiments like this and then maybe even do a prototype and then see if that prototype works better. So that could be your data that's backing your decision. Then you can sharpen your story and then use this to convince them. So this is very important. A few more tips of great storytelling in presentation, which is an important uh, way of delivering your data analysis. Get to the heart of things. That's the most important. Like do not do not talk things that are not useful and not key to what you're trying to convince. So get to the heart of it. Cut to the chase. Get your audience excited about what what's to follow, and make it as a good story. Good stories have twists and turns. One thing leads to the other. There's continuity. Make it exciting, not just a list of facts. And then do tell them the facts, but then punch at the end, meaning ask for what what you're trying to present and then what what conclusion you are coming up with keeping it simple is very important like are you using a lot of words are you using few words are you using an image very important to keep it simple the so slides are going to be very boring if it's a lot of words and then finally rehearse 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 like practice 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 until you feel that you're confident you're competent you're convincing ask someone to listen to you get feedback continuously rehearse 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 is most important so it's very important to, to convince people. Now let's take a look at um, predictive prescriptive analytics and for machine learning slightly in detail. So there are multiple steps that are that are that are going into predictive and prescriptive analysis, which is one of the four types that we discussed previously here. Where we are trying to build models that can tell you are we are we choosing the right people? Is is can we do better? What are some of the features? So machine learning, there are five rough steps. You need to define the problem. If you do not define the problem and define the objective function really well, then then, then that's the basis. Everything goes wrong after that. Then you need to generate labels. In generating labels, you're actually looking at the reality and finding out and labeling the real outcome. So this is what the machine uses to learn. These are the labels that machine uses to learn. So label generation is second step. The third step is to build right features that are important. This is where machine learning engineering team can help in a pretty big way to find out what features are important. They need to deploy the model and see how it works, evaluate it, and improve the model. There are many algorithms that can be used for machine learning. Logistic regression, decision trees, random forest, gradient boosted trees, support vector machines, mostly classification algorithms, neural networks, and deep learning. So there are these steps that computers use to learn to classify for predictive and prescriptive analytics. An example for this would be, um, is a given person uh, likely to click this ad or interested in this ad? Then you need to know what is the type of the person, the gender of the person, the propensity of them in the past, and all of that. Right. So there are many labels that you can use. Or if you want to predict whether this person will download WhatsApp or WeChat. So there's various models you can use for building this. To understand the model, confusion metrics is another important thing you should Google and learn about as to what is true, true negative, what's false positive, what's false negative, what's true positive, and how do you measure various terms of a given model. So there are various metrics in which you can use to measure the performance of a given model. So false positive is error in classification. False positive is basically thinking about it intuitively as wrong people or wrong candidates were classified as, as accurate. Meaning if you 
if you tell someone you have cancer when they don't, then that's false positive. False negative is if someone has cancer and if you told them you, they don't have cancer. So it's a missed opportunity. You should have classified them correctly as having cancer. So that's false negative. True positive is you found someone who has cancer and you told them that they have cancer. True negative is you found someone who doesn't have cancer and told them they don't have cancer. So that's true negative. Position and recall. These are the two big terms that you will find often when you talk to machine learning engineers. Very important to get a deep intuitive sense and I've tried to list out my intuitive sense here as to what some of these terms mean. Um, so precision is basically is a number that tells you the rate at which the current prediction is correct. So think about this as confidence. Like if precision is 0.91, that means 91% times this number that is true prediction is actually true. So what is the confidence in this answer being right? That's precision. And recall is catching all possible true predictions. It's like coverage. Like how many cancer patients can you actually predict as true, that are true? So you need really high recall for life critical situations like cancer detection. You want the true predictions to be captured and you want them to be highly precise too, but you want really high recall. And so you want their sensitivity to be really high to be able to catch issues that are life threatening. Precision in this case could be like a marketing campaign. It could be high or low, but the higher the better, but it doesn't cause like life threatening issues. And then overall accuracy is how often is classified correct. So there are many metrics used to understand the behavior of various algorithms. Um, and that's what comes in the evalu evaluation step. So very important for us to know some of the details here and there's like course and courses you can take to understand machine learning, but this is a high level overview. There are a lot of interesting technologies used today um, for for the nine steps that we discussed earlier here. Like we need to be able to set up tracking, we need to do ETL, we need to build monitoring dashboards. So let's take a look at what are some of the things that we use today. Um, so Kafka is used heavily for creating tracking events. Um, it's messaging based tracking. Spark uses for various things. One other thing it can do is ETLing the data into clean stores. A lot of data is now stored in cloud so that you could have dynamic scaling and availability with low, low cost, especially when you're starting up. They're a huge company, maybe they're still not low cost as of now, but very soon they're going to be low cost. You need a way to analyze your data and reproduce the data and share the data. So Jupyter is another tool that's getting more and more popular popularity compared to Excel. Tableau is another uh, way for you to publish, share, and monitor and uh, visualize. Power BI is also gaining steam in terms of feature parity and it's going to be more and more popular for visualization analysis. So these are some of the stacks that are currently used and one of the big things is track everything is another new thing that I'm hearing um, to be able to go back in the past and make sense of the data. So overall we went through a lot of things. We looked at uh, what a, that the data is everywhere, that every company, every engineering company needs to be able to look at data and make decisions based out of data. Many important products can be built with data. Uh, there are various requirements of making sure that engineers in the team can actually use data and be able to set up data pipeline at scale. We understood how we can look at the past, look at what happened today in the future, we can predict the future and all of that with data. So data is huge. We look at nine steps and various tools we can use to set up data pipeline. And there are different types of analysis that we looked at. A-B testing, huge, huge topic. We looked at why it's important to measure everything that goes out and only take the winning variant. And finally, we looked at like why is it important to present your data in ways that is convincing to solve the business problems, uh, understand who we're trying to convince, assemble the data, and share it with a good story. That, that goes to the heart of things, it's simple, and it's quite practiced. We also gave a little bit of overview of machine learning on various types of things that are important, what types of things go in, into machine learning, what are some of the ways to measure models, precision recall, huge, huge importance if you are working with a data 
team or engineering team to understand and have a pretty good gut sense of what precision recall means and some of the current technologies that we use. Hope you find it useful. Thank you.